Hi, it's Jesse. Today on the show, you know her for her iconic characters and impressions on shows like Saturday Night Live and 30 Rock, and most recently as a podcast host on her new show, Woo Woo. It's Rachel Dratch. Once on The View, they're like, we're going to have you imitate Barbara Walters, like next to her or something. And I was like, and I was like, is she okay with this? You know, and like, I couldn't quite tell if she was okay. I got the feeling she was not. This is Dinners on Me, and I'm your host, Jesse Tyler Ferguson. Okay, like most dedicated fans of Saturday Night Live, I have my own opinion about when the SNL golden era was, when the show was at its very best. Listen, I continue to fall in love with the new cast members the show brings on, but they will always be matched against the high bar that was the SNL women of the early aughts. I'm talking about Tina Fey, Amy Poehler, Maya Rudolph, Anna Gasteyer, and yes, Rachel Dratch. I have been a long-time Dratch fan. I consider her to be a comedic genius. I mean, she created both Debbie Downer and Boston teen Denise. I, I Come on. I was so excited when our universes finally collided and we became actual friends. Rachel is one of those funny people who is just so naturally hilarious without even trying, which I think is the reason I find her comedy so appealing. It's just effortless. It's also why her brand of comedy has transferred so beautifully to the stage. I was absolutely thrilled that we were both nominated for our first Tony Awards together a few years ago. As newbies, we clung to each other through many of the press junkets and luncheons we attended over that award season. I am so grateful that I had such a good friend to share my anxiety with over those few months. And I was just excited to reunite and catch up with her over a meal. Rachel, we're over here. We're over here, Rachel. Hi. I brought Rachel Dratch to Mexican restaurant Atla in NoHo in New York City. Atla is a slightly more casual concept by chef Enrique Olvera, who you might know from Pujol in Mexico City or Damian in Los Angeles. Atla has the same traditional ingredients you love, but with an inventive twist. Like, I know Brussels and peanuts in a taco sounds strange, but listen, I'm telling you, it works. I thought it would be the perfect pairing for Rachel, who I've enjoyed many a salt rim glass filled with tequila with in my day. Okay, let's get to the conversation. So how does this work? Do we like... We're going to order, and we're going to eat, and we're going to (laughs) chat, and I'm going to make you cry. You are? Barbara Walters style? (laughs) Barbara Walters style. (laughs) Did you ever meet her? Oh, yes, I met her. Well, I used to do her on, I know. on that, SNL, why but you after Sherry up? O'Terry. Yes. Um, which basically, I mean, Sherry, we all know I was just imitating your imitation, so let's just get that <laughs> out there. But, um, but yeah, so then once on The View, they're like, we're going to have you imitate Barbara Walters, like next to her or something. And I was oh like, God, Rachel. and I was like, is she okay with this? You know, and like, I couldn't quite tell if she was okay. I got the feeling she was not but well, I mean it wasn't like a, it wasn't the Gilda Radner like Baba Wawa like it wasn't gonna insult anyone sure but um anyway I don't know that she I liked forgot that, that Gilda so much. Radner also yes oh. and Brian Walters did not did, like that did Sherry O'Terry we're talking showbiz it's here showbiz guys. kids showbiz <laughs> so I am coming onto your podcast this yes, week yes you are yes Friday woo woo um how did you come up with this idea to do woo-woo? Okay, so this is kind of funny, but I, I just, like, um, over the years, I've sort of amassed stories from other people of, like, cool ghost stories or, yeah. like, stories that have kind of made me, like, you know, maybe we don't know what's out there. Like, yeah, maybe there's yeah. a lot we don't know. So I like the mystery of it all. So then now I'm, I just am starting to veer into the territory where people might think I'm, I'm nuts. <laughs> like, like, like my reputation, not that it's so it's great tarnished. anymore, but it may be tarnished. And I may be into like, she's a nut bird. She like, thinks she everything was, is a uh, yeah, like, supernatural she's experience. She's a ghost lady. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so I sort of always try to leave room for that this yeah. might be just, there might be a logical Hello. Hello. Wait, let me turn this around Thank so I can you. get some chair. First time here? Yes, it is. Amazing. We're basically a very traditional Mexican restaurant with our own innovative touch. Okay. And, uh, well, some of the highlights we can give to you is the guacamole is very great. Besides that, we do recommend having the cheese quesadilla, very authentic. Uh, we make our own corn tortilla, so it's very warm and nice. Uh, besides that, the pork al pastor gringa, uh, uh, the chicken soup, it's our chef's grandmother recipe. 
and then from there on we, we do recommend uh, sharing a couple of things. And if you're feeling a little fun tonight or today well, morning, we have margaritas <laughs> to start, Usually fresh waters fun. or coffee. Oh, okay. You know what, I might get, this is so boring, but I might get coffee just to, mm, so I get a personality start. for this podcast. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> Thank, but, um, <laughs> Thank you. I was going to I didn't gonna, have any coffee. I was going to suggest that, I, <laughs> Rachel. <laughs> Can I get um, the Cafe Con Leche with coconut milk? Cafe Con Leche with coconut milk. Yeah. I th I'll do the same. Oh, look at us. Okay. Great. Right. You what want is, to start maybe with like a guacamole or chips Yes, and definitely guacamole and chips. Uh, definitely guacamole. Okay. okay. I guess we'll look this Honestly, up. the chicken soup oh, yeah. was one of the best chicken soups really? I've ever had in my entire life. It is. It is. Oh, my. We can we can think about it for a moment. Okay, okay, we'll think about it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, well, I was so yeah. relieved when you said that Amy Poehler also is like oh, on, your, on your on your show and yeah. does not have a good boo, -boo no. story. She just came on and basically debunked your whole podcast. Is that what it was? Well, I haven't she, listened to her no, episode yet. See, every episode we say like, now we don't you know we don't believe in all this. So it's just this is what happened to someone. Yeah, yeah. You know, do with this what you will. Like, so when Amy came on, she wasn't like, "This is bullshit," but she was yeah. just like, "Like she's like, show me, show me a cup that moves." That was what she said. <laughs> show me a ghost. So show me a picture of a ghost. We were Literally. Like, oh, well, we just saw a picture of a dog ghost. Yeah. Yeah. We, we challenged her. So, um, but she's funny about exhibit it. A. She's exhibit A dog ghost, and then she looks and she's like, "That could just be a photo glitch." You know, she's one yeah, of those yeah, people. Yeah, I get yeah, it yeah, though. Yeah, I get it because a but lot that's of also kind of fun. It is fun, and also then she's very into the enneagram. Do you know what that is? No, tell me. Okay, so enneagram is a whole system <clears throat> where you take this test, like it's online or whatever, and it tells you like there's nine types. Okay. And so Amy uses it a lot in dealing with people at work, and like she really uses the system. She's like, "Well, they're a five, so they're gonna want to hear it like this." How, How does she it? find out the numbers? She just like. Well, she, of course, had her whole office take the test, I think. Like, it was a fun thing, you know. The problem is, this is like, there's certain things that won't stick in my head, and this is one of them. Okay. Like, she was shocked that I didn't remember what her number was. But the, for whatever reason, like, I can't learn about the space program, and I can't learn about Enneagrams, because, like, anytime I try to be like, like, I did the Celebrity Jeopardy thing. Yeah, 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 and yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, yeah. what if I just try to learn about space? Because that was the one subject I'm like, I know. And I literally looked at Wikipedia for, like, two seconds. I was like... Snooze. I just can't. <laughs> and, and so, no, Enneagram's not a snooze for me, but it will not stick in my head yeah. about, like where it came from, what it is. Yeah, and she yeah, gets yeah. mad at me about it. But anyways, whoa, look at this. Ooh. Thank you. Look at that. Gorgeous. Listeners, I'm looking at a tortilla. <laughs> it looks a little different than your regular. No, it's uh, Anyways, okay. I'm going to move this over to you. Yeah, bring it over here. Um, Have you done the Tyler Henry um, thing? No. Do you have want you? to? No. I have. You have? Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. that's an area that I, that's my most, that's the area I'm most skeptical in. Why? Why? Mm -hmm. I love you instantly, fire back. Why? Um, oh, no. <laughs> well, I think, like, I think it's just really easy for these people to be really general. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. Wait, I do want to hear, like, I want to, I would love it if that were true. I mean... So you talked to Tyler Henry. I talked to Hot Tyler Henry. He came to my house. So I was like, I, he couldn't have, in my opinion, prepared ahead of time. And there was actually some stuff off camera that he talked to me about with my sister that I ended up like relaying to her and it ended up being actually very useful information for her. Mm. And that's something that he couldn't have known about. It was like health stuff. And oh, um, cool. so I thought okay, that was like very believe. interesting. I do want to believe. I want to believe in psychics. And I would love to believe in me. Well, I, I mean, I think you do. You I went do to believe, a psychic. Oh, you went to a psychic who basically predicted the, a, your whole next chapter she's of your a life. Strong lady. Is she a strong lady? We're talking about the coffee, <laughs> not the psychic. Um, um, yes, yes. I did go to a friend. Took me to a channeler, who told me I was going to have a kid. Yeah. And I was 43 and not dating anyone. And, and then what happened? Then it all came true. Yeah. So that kind of made me a believer. I will say. Yeah. Sure. Um, I mean, explain what happened. Oh wait, let me just ask. Oh, should we order more things, too? Yeah, we can or, do that, yeah. Oh, could we get more coconut milk, too? Yeah, That's just a sidebar, so. yeah. But then I think he was going to order us. Yeah. Let's do the carrot salad. What's what's the mushroom thing? The, the mushroom and sauce. Yeah, it. what is that? So it's basically a bowl that contains three types of mushrooms. You get the maitake crispy on top, shiitake and oyster mushrooms. Or okay. salsa verde and a side of tortilla. Let's do it's it. Like a, that sounds good. Yeah. Let's do that. And then the Brussels sprout taco. We'll just split it. Okay, yeah. If you want, I can send one per person. Sure, if you want to, yeah. How's everything so far? Really good. Um, oh, yeah, so that story, a friend took me on my 43rd birthday. 
she told me I was going to meet someone in three months. And then she's like, no, wait, three to six months. And you're going to have one child. And so at the time I was thinking like, uh, like, I mean, I had always wanted kids, but I wasn't really like yeah. at this point I kind of let go of the idea because I was 43. Yeah. I wasn't going to do it on my own. Just that's how I was thinking back then. Well, then four months later, I met John at a bar around the corner, <laughs> formerly known as Shulbreds, and uh, <laughs> now something else. But anyway, um, and then started long distance dating, and then lo and behold, got the shock of my life when I was pregnant, and then so you weren't now always long distance. Wasn't always long distance, and now <laughs> have a 13 year old boy, Eli. Eli. So that definitely was a life shifter. I mean, obviously, yeah. having a child was, but I mean, in terms of thinking about, you know, our psychics believable, right, right, like right. that was. I mean, that was pretty accurate. It was, yeah. Wildly so, accurate. Wildly accurate. Uh, but I, I mean, you, you talk so eloquently about, you know, motherhood at. at 40 oh, with John in, the, in your book. I mean... Yeah, uh, and you have fatherhood. I have fatherhood at, at 40, at yeah. 40, yeah. And I knew you during this time. Yes, and I broke the news to you, the surprise news. Right. I remember we were upstairs at Glass House. That's right. That's a bar that a lot of theater folks hang out at. <laughs> I'm dropping all this theater stuff. Um, thank you so much. Rachel's side of coconut um, milk that she demanded. Yum. Thank you Ooh, so it's much. Warm My pleasure. Too. Thank you. So uh, okay, so but what yeah, so I how, found so yeah. fascinating was like, and this is just this is not how most people raise children, but you were basically pregnant with and raising a child with someone that you were still kind of getting to know. Yes, yeah. I know you guys are no longer together, but like, it's we a really interesting. Yeah. S- we actually do situation. a lot of things together. He yeah. lives right nearby. Yeah, and no, we, we definitely have an unconventional. I'd say we have a very unconventional setup. So yeah, yeah, he's very involved, dad, and. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, doubt, I, doubt, doubt. Eli, I'm sure, has changed your life in so many ways that you never expected to. And, like, I certainly feel like with my kids, I'm like, I mean, there's every day they're teaching me things. But it is, um, you know, being a parent in your 40s. I mean, I'll, I'll be 49 this year. Okay. It's exhausting. And now you have the little one, too. Now we have a little one as well. And how old is he? 15, 16 months. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. You're making me do that math. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so I remember, like, this might sound, what I don't know, I don't remember being, like, super tired and run down. I think because I was on this kind of high. Yeah. I know that sounds like, oh, you're remembering it this way or whatever. But um, I think because th- this came as such an unexpected, like, you know, lottery win sort right. of for me. So... And then, oh, the other thing is that I really wasn't working much when Eli was really little. Like, yeah. I know you, you work a lot and you're, you're very busy. Not always. Okay, because I think of you as, like, constantly working. Currently in a, good in a way, lull. In a Currently great in way. a lull. Currently in a lull. Okay. I was in, like, a four-year lull, and I'm not being self-deprecating, whatever. It just was, like, it was, I was off, let's see. No, I had been off SNL a while. Yeah. because yeah, I was... 44 when I had him. So things were like really, really slow for me work-wise. And I was kind of lamenting it. But then Eli came along and then everything flipped. And then I was kind of, you know, I, I, I did enough things so I was like making a living, like random right. voiceovers and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, so then I had all this time. So I can imagine being less tired when yeah. I wasn't going to work a 12-hour day yeah. and all that stuff, you know. Thank you. What is this? Oh, nice. Yeah, perfect. Ooh. Gorgeous. Thank you. Oh my god, this is so good. When Eli came around, yeah. Where, like, where were you? You said you were in a law. Well, maybe everyone's like this, but I think I was on SNL at that point where you still thought like, <clears throat> oh, you you do SNL, and then you're a movie star, and it's not like that. In but, truth, I mean that's kind of like a template that is created. And, with yeah, SNL. and some people do have that. I think I just thought like, oh, you do SNL, and then like, it's easy to walk in and get your own sitcom or whatever, sure. and then. You know, it's some people don't have that journey. Right. Like the red carpet doesn't roll out for the whole rest of your no. time. And also, you have to flip into like, well, what do I want? Because it's easy to go really passive and be like, nobody's calling me. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, that's where I tend to go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not proud of that. Yeah. But you tend to be like, why isn't someone offering me something? <laughs> you know, like, where's the next great thing? And then you realize, like, okay. I have to do this myself, and what do I want that to be? Like, that's right. always hard. Right. And that's, not to get back to woo-woo, but manifesting kind of makes you be specific about what you want. Sure. And in kind of a joking way, but even if you're not into all that woo-woo stuff, 
even just taking charge of what you want yeah. and trying to make it happen instead of thinking someone from the outside is going to solve that for you. Sure. Even as I'm saying this, I'm realizing that I need to do this like today. Like, it's <laughs> but never it's interesting ends, that you yeah. were thinking that at that time because you were, you know, in this sort of passive state like, where you were kind of hoping that something would come to you. This is how I'm right. seeing it. And then the universe gave you this thing that you had no control over that was like, this oh, is right, going to happen. Right. Like, right. this is something that you're going to focus on. Ooh. And I feel like also, I mean, weren't you at that point... Tell me if I'm remembering this wrong, but weren't you already kind of writing a book and it was going to be just about your bad dating stories and then oh, yeah. in the middle of this? When when nothing was happening, I started writing like, you know, like for the moth, that kind of thing. Right, yeah, yeah. Like moth type of stories, just as a sort of creative exercise. So I had this little stack of those stories and then um, like there's a literary agent at my agency and she liked them and she's like, okay, where does it all go? Like mm-hmm. what... And I didn't know. So then, of course, I'm I'm a I'm a lazy Pisces. No, so, <laughs> so <laughs> um, no. So then I sort of just let those sit around. And I kind of forgot about uh-huh. it. And then, um, and then when I got pregnant, I was like, oh, like this could be, right? You know, this. And then, then I came back. I was like, I got a plot twist for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, a huge plot so twist. So then, yeah. So the stories in the beginning of the book, like I didn't know that later the second half of the book there was going to be this surprise baby so Um, there was something wasn't there something about a cannibal oh my god there was a guy who he wasn't really a cannibal but he (laughs) (laughs) he he was Was talking about the nickname for him like the the sex and cities ladies always have a nickname for their no he was talking about um, eating horse meat and he said have you ever tried horse meat and I was like oh my god was this a first date question kinda and I was like um no, oh, I don't know if I could eat horse meat, you know. And then he's like, "Well, have you ever wondered what it would be like to taste human flesh?" Oh, <laughs> that's how he said it. And I was like, "No, he wasn't like creepy. Like his vibe wasn't like I really thought he had human flesh in the right. basement." But he did ask that, and then I was like, "No, because I'd just be wondering, you know, who is this yeah, on who the is plate?" This person? You know. And um, <laughs> do so, I know but, you? And, but the funny thing is, he made like a second date, right? So then, but then he totally blew me off for the second date. Like, I just took it really to heart. You got and rejected then, by the horse meat guy. Yeah, and then um, I went to meet my friend that same night, and I was really bummed, and I walked in, and I looked, like, really sad, and she's just like, I got one word for you, horse meat. And then <laughs> that did make me laugh, because it was like, well, look what you're, like, sad about. I know. Mm. I do find it so remarkable. I mean, that... You know, you have this group of friends that you've known for so long, for decades, really. Yeah. Uh, and in the yeah. case of Amy and Tina, like, you know, yeah. like three decades. And But that cast that you were in with Saturday Night Live, you've all remained so close. And I, I do feel like SNL is one of those things where, like, every time there's a new era, you're always like, this is the greatest cast. Totally. But honestly, like, you look back at those seven years that you were on, I really do consider, like, golden years of SNL. Truly. That's the thing, like, everyone about SNL, everyone, like, in the public loves to bag on it. And then they also love to say, it's not the same as when you were in it. Yeah, 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 you yeah. were in the best. But they, I'm sure they say that to every, like, if they saw Adam Sandler, if they saw yeah. Dan Aykroyd, sure. and they, and they saw Cecily Strong, like, that's the other thing about SNL is, like, you know, it's everyone's favorite punching bag, but it's also everyone grew up with it. So, um, of course I love SNL because yeah. I you know, grew I up mean, with it and all that. I mean, incredible. Yeah. But it's also like, it's very rare to be a part of a show that obviously has had such longevity, but there have been so many iterations of it and you're just part of its like vast yeah. history. Maybe it's just because I'm friends with you and I know Amy and you yeah. know, I love that cast so much. But I find myself when I'm going back to like look at like YouTubes of SNL, I'm, I feel like I'm always in that era. Yeah. You know, I really am struck by it's just how close you have remained specifically with the female ensemble of that that season I mean yeah. you and Maya and Amy and, and Tina um, yeah. and Anna yeah I mean it's sort of like well same with Chicago the whole improv scene like we came up in the same vibe you <laughs> yeah, know yeah. so you know that they're gonna bring it you yeah. know so I love that and then same with SNL like there's that um, franticness of putting up a show in a week and yeah and the live audience, you know, and you're in this extreme experience with mm-hmm. each other. So, and everyone's ego is like pulverized <laughs> at some yeah. point, you know, like you get like broken down, built back up, broken down, yeah. but, you know, all that stuff. So, um, there's just something about that sort of 
shared bond that right. um, both emotionally and, you know, comedically sort yeah. of. I am fascinated the by the process of SNL because it Wait, is like have a you ever war zone. SNL? I've never hosted SNL. Oh my God, you should. I've been dying to do it. Um, yeah. But the process of putting that show together, I've heard about like what it's like during that week, trying to like, you know, write things and get them on the air. And it sounds like a war zone every single week. And then you get to Saturday and you do this thing and you complete it and then you have to start all over yeah. again with every three weeks a week off. Yeah. So you can like live mm -hmm. and breathe and eat. Um, but explain to me, because everyone that I've talked to said it's a really grueling experience and it can be, like, you have to really have a thick skin to get through that week. You, d I mean, it's been so long ago now, but, um, just in terms of the, the schedule, mm -hmm. Monday night's the pitch meeting and then you write on Monday and Tuesday, but everyone writes Tuesday way late. Like everyone's there till what the wee hours in the morning and then Wednesday you um, have the read through around the table and everyone from the staff is there. Listening. With the guest host? With the guest host and everyone's reading their parts. And like, the parts are cast just by the writer. So like whoever's writing, they just say so-and-so says it and that's who it is. And then, um, so then like you see what scenes get laughs or what doesn't and you know, that's always like. That's gotta be that's, the, the hardest part of the week. It's, well, it's like usually if you have a really good feeling about a scene, it'll yeah. probably get laughs at the table. Like yeah. often if you don't feel really good about it, you know, it might not get laughed. Right, right. <laughs> but anyway, so then you go off and goof off with your friends, and then the picks come out just like high school yeah, musical calls. thing. You know, the the sheets go out and things are circled, and I don't know. By now, maybe it's maybe it's Who all digital, them? but back then it was on paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Emails um, were It's just out. like these packets are like strewn around a room, like with the circled scenes on them. Do you know who puts the circles around the scenes? Is it Lauren? Well, in the, the so it's like the Lauren, the head writers, the host has a okay. say, and then like a few producing people sort okay. of. So the host can kill an idea. Yeah, but some hosts are more hands-on than others. Like some hosts come like in and they're just like, do whatever. Well, some someone like, she might come in with like her own ideas right, even. Right, someone right, that's right, a big right. comedian like that. Right. But, um, but yeah, like- But some, Donald Trump. <laughs> Donald Trump, he's probably just gonna do what you tell him to um, in that situation. Um, <laughs> and that's the only situation. Um, yeah. But no, then like if there's an athlete that comes in or something, yeah, those yeah. are always fun. Like that's a whole other thing. Like sometimes the, the Oscar winners don't make the best hosts because they're, care too much right, and they right. want to like be real whatever yeah, you know like yeah, they don't yeah, have yeah. that sketch quality right but right. an athlete they don't they don't care like they're they want to just have fun they're used to the pressure too yeah. so like they come in those shows are usually really fun one of my favorite things to i've already told you this so many times but one of my favorite things to rewatch is what i believe is your first time doing debbie downer with oh with the laughing yeah at disneyland yes if you haven't seen this, it is probably if you were like were to like make a top ten list of like SNL like gone off the tracks, yeah, like that would be they, number one. Yeah, probably. Yeah. It is so funny. Every single one of you loses it. I actually talked to Fred about this when I he had didn't him laugh, on. He though, right? He was the only one who didn't laugh. I know. I think. He was like stone faced. Yeah. It was. It is so g. It, it, I can't imagine it. I don't want to see that sketch go well in that situation. Like in the moment of when oh, yeah. you, when everything was kind of going off the tracks, like. I imagine if I was you, I would be immediately sweaty. I would be already like listening to the conversations of me getting yelled at afterwards. So Debbie Downer, I I had a good feeling about it, and it was making me laugh. And Paula, Paula, and I wrote it together. Yeah. Like we were laughing at it a lot, but you still don't know. So then in dress rehearsal, Jimmy and Horatio were laughing a lot in dress rehearsal. I didn't. Even, and then I was thinking like, you guys, like in my mind, I was like, you guys. You better not laugh at this. Like this is, I really want this. It's also so much pressure on you. I know. So I was like, please let this go. Well, then in the one, I think I was like so wanting it to work. Yeah. I mean, if I'm gonna be honest, <laughs> I was like so wanting this to go that I was like in this like hyped up energy around yeah. it. So then at dress rehearsal, I flubbed some little line. Like I was supposed to say, like, <laughs> like, do you guys hear about that train crash in North Korea? And then, um. <laughs> I was supposed to say the media is so secretive there, but I said the media is so sensitive yeah. and so secretive, they may never know how many people perished. And then I think I was just like so nervous that I started laughing a little. And then when you think, and then you know the camera's coming in on yeah, you each time. For the so that's wah, like, wah. Yeah. And then like, you know, it's a close up. Yeah. And then I don't, I was just like, I don't know. Oh, I kind of left my body and I was broke. like laughing. 
for the whole thing. But now it's like a phrase, and people don't even know there was a scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. like you're being think, such a Debbie Downer. People think I wrote a scene based on the phrase. Yeah. Like, people think... So, anyway. Yeah, you're part of the zeitgeist. But listen, youngsters. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Oh, oh, my God, Rachel. Um, Wine Country, this film you wrote with Anna. No, I didn't write one. You didn't write it? Wine Country was written by Emily Spivey and Liz Kukowski and conceived also by Amy Poehler, too. Okay, yeah. and that's based on your 50th it's loosely birthday? loosely based. We, went, we took a trip to Wine Country for my 50th birthday. And then um, the... It was very loosely based because there's not that much that really happened in it, but what really it's happened... It's like cocaine bear. There was a bear who ate cocaine, <laughs> but then we got to move on from there. Exactly. Like, what happened next? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the only things that were really true were... Um, we did have a grumpy tarot card reader. Yes. Who was very grouchy and didn't want us to touch the cards. And, was, and her name <laughs> was something like... Um, I think in the movie they called her Lady Sunshine. <laughs> but in the in real life, she was like rainbow goddess or something like that. So Cherry Jones played this grouchy tarot reader. And then the other thing is that my friend um, Gerard makes really does make paella. So we really did have a paella <laughs> chef come, but nothing like the Jason Schwartzman character who slept with everybody. In the movie. Right, right, right. Um, and was really creepy. So um, that yeah, they ju- we just had the paella guy. But yes. um, but that was so fun because you get to be like on vacation with your pals. On so vacation with your pals, amazing. recreating your fiftieth yeah. birthday. Yeah, I loved it. So good. I love also that you have this deep commitment to doing theater now. I was, I mean, that's how I started out. Yeah. Way back when. Um, so then I always had this dream of being on Broadway. Yeah. But I don't really sing. So that you've done so many so, musicals. I have. Well, let me back up a little bit. Okay. So POTUS. Can you tell me the full title again. Um, for every dumbass or seven women here, trying I think to keep I have them alive. It here. I have it right here. I have it right here. It's um, so the full title was POTUS or behind every great behind dumbass every are dumbass. seven every women trying, to, trying to, keep to keep them alive. Right. So it was about these women working in the White House under a Donald Trump like esque. Yeah. President. Yeah, Clinton it's sort of mixed with Trump. Okay. It's like yeah, yeah, yeah. They take all the qualities of various presidents. Um. So, yeah, so it was me, Julie White, Lee Delaria, Vanessa Williams, Lily Cooper, Julianne Huff, and Susie Nakamura. Nakamura. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Um, we got to just, I don't know. Be, it was such a brilliant play. You guys were so hilarious. You were nominated you. for a Tony Award. Yes, thank you, Tony winner. <laughs> the same season as me. Same season. Which was so fun because I've known you for so long. And that was our first Tony nominations. So to go through all those like luncheons and everything yeah. with someone that I love so much yes. was so special. Yes. Um, we would always gravitate toward one another at these yes. like events because we didn't really know. I wasn't in on the Broadway scene. <laughs> yeah, I'd see like, someone I knew. I was like, you'd oh. Be like, Shh, show me around, Jesse. I did 24 hour plays with Sam Rockwell. Hi. Hi, Sam Rockwell. <laughs> like that kind of well, what was that like for you? I mean, that's such a. I mean,. I've always dreamed of getting a Tony Award nomination. Like, that's just, I'll just say it. Did you, was that something that you saw for yourself or you even dreamed for yourself? No, or was that- no. I mean, my, you know, I have my little dream list and doing Broadway was one of them. Yeah. I've never been to any of these award shows. I've never been to the Emmys, let alone be nominated. Like, you haven't I, been to the Emmys? I've never been to the Emmys, the Oscars, none of this. Like, I'm just not in that sort of circuit. But so, no, I, I didn't have this on my, my list yeah. of dreams. So that was a total... Surprise. Have you tried those mushrooms? They're yeah, so spicy. Really, I know, very spicy, right? They're delicious. Excuse me. So, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. But, this? I mean, it was so special, too, that, like, Eli was your date to the Tony Awards. Yeah. There was something, seeing you go through that and seeing you sort of be praised and celebrated in that way, for me, was just, it felt very satisfying. Aww, thank you. And also that, like, Eli was sort of, like, with you through that and, like, old enough to, like, really appreciate it, too. Yeah. Um, I mean, what I liked in terms of the satisfying of it all was um, I feel like comedy doesn't often get... Like, it's kind of rare that a comedy part gets nominated, I think. There was no maybe way you were not going to get nominated. Maybe it's more common a little bit for Broadway than, like, right. like Oscars. Sure. like. They like Melissa they McCarthy getting an Oscar nomination was crazy for Yeah, because they just don't... Yeah. I think it's because comedians make things look easy and, like, they look so effortless. That, right. And I don't think it's hard. I mean, maybe you're the same. Like, like when people say, well, comedy is really hard. Like, 
I don't feel like that. You because know I, I feel like doing a giant death scene would be really hard. Right, right. It's not my wheelhouse. Well, I find from, I mean, I find comedy comes easy, but creating a different version, because like I, I have a bag of tricks that I pull from, and sometimes like I got to get a deeper bag. Like I feel like I'm, I'm hit, I'm bringing out the same tricks. And maybe SNL actually was really uh, an amazing place to train to find different ways because every week you really had to find very different ways into funny characters. But yeah, I mean, I was just so struck by how, first of all, because your character in POTUS was, you know, we've all seen the character who's who's high or like on hallucinogens. Yeah. And for some reason you were able to like bring all these new things to it. Like it was just so freaking genius. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> um, th- my approach to it was, so I always, I'm not into drugs. Like, uh-huh. I'm not in, So I really hate, like, someone's drug story. Yeah. Like, when they're like, oh, my God, we were so high that we blah, blah. I'm just like, the fact that you're already on drugs, like, yes, crazy things yeah, are going to yeah, happen. Yeah, yeah. So with that said, like, I wanted to make it so that each little scene that she had when she was on drugs was different. Like, it yeah. was a different vibe to each scene. So it wasn't just like, I'm crazy and on drugs. So I right. wanted to, like, have a sort of a journey and make each one a, a different, different phases phase. of the drug yeah. Yeah, which yeah, 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 yeah. so Selena spells that out in the script okay. she's like you're yeah. gonna go through these phases you know? like, yeah yeah like the angry um, phase yeah it was incredible Rachel I loved Thank doing that you. so this much it's like a, a love um, fest here I know right I'm just sitting here being crazed <laughs> and eating guacamole and eating guacamole what do you think you want to do next I mean I know you're always still like speaking writing of and what speaking I was up saying, I don't know I gotta figure this out um do you think that Eli, like, has absorbed any of your talents well, and, like, might, like, you have a career I in do that think world? He's, Cause I think he's I, really I think funny. He, yeah, it's so funny. I think he could totally do this. In, like, he's a natural, yeah. but he doesn't really... He used to, he used to be more um, into the idea of someday being an actor or writer, but... Um, He's way too into basketball right now, so well, all that's like fallen by the wayside. But no, and of course I'm not like, honey, you've got to be an actor. That's like yeah, the last yeah, yeah, thing yeah, a yeah. parent says. So I think he has a good creative. Uh, I think he's funny, and I think he has. He's a, he's a ham. He is. He yeah. has performing energy, but not in a gross way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we'll see. What I, about your kids? I don't know. They're too young. I, I feel like Beckett is super sensitive but also Ooh. the things that come out of his mouth I'm like really? that's like very uh, sophisticated some of these yeah. thoughts that he has um, and then Sullivan just sort of you know I mean he's so young it's hard right, to tell right. but like he just sort of seems like he's gonna sit back and like just let everything roll off his back but I think about this a lot because Beckett's now at that age where that Aubrey was the girl who played my daughter on, on Modern Family she wow. was Beckett's age when wow. I first met her really yeah. Wait, so how old is Beckett? Beckett's a, a little over three and a half now. Oh my gosh, she was that. He'll young? be four. He'll be four in uh, July. Wow. And yeah, so she was about that age um, oh my gosh. when she got cast in the third season, and I can't even imagine, you know, him being in that situation. So like, it's oh, it's weird. Like I, I can't even dream that for him at this point. Oh. Has Eli seen any of your SNL? Barely. Really. He's like, I don't know. He doesn't really gravitate towards it. And then I'm not like, You're not, yeah, yeah. sit look, down look, and watch Mama this. Mama wants to show you her tapes. But you know what we did watch, though? <laughs> this was the cool one. For This was like the, for a 13-year-old boy, this yeah. was the, I did the voice on Spider-Man. Uh-huh. Oh, the yeah, Spider-verse yeah, 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 thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the guidance counselor thing. Like, that was like I, I he, raided with all of his friends, that's finally. So cool. but But ordinarily, like, I don't do things... I don't have a lot of things for kids or that right. age or whatever. So. Right, right, right. So, yeah, he's not... He doesn't... He's not that impressed, I, but in um, a good way, I mean. I did a, an episode of Sesame Street where I interacted oh, yeah. with Cookie Monster. Yeah, so did I. Did you really? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, that's the wildest thing. To like, oh, yeah. I mean, Sesame Street's all of our childhood. No matter how old you are, it's a part of your childhood. Mm-hmm. So to, to enter that set and to see, you know, the street. And then I do have a photo of um, me open mouth kissing Elmo. I'm just going to say it's out there. For real? It looks like he's eating my face. Yeah. It's genius. <laughs> and Justin's in the photo with me, like, with a su- totally surprise oh. look. <laughs> anyway. Um, but I was in the scene with Cookie Monster, and so I showed Beckett. And I was like, is it going to be weird if I show him this video of me 
with Cookie Monster, and I was really nervous to do it because like he's at that age where he doesn't really understand why I'm on. Uh, it's me on the phone because I was showing it to him on the phone. He's okay, a different yeah. relationship. Like he watches videos of himself sometimes. <laughs> he's such an egomaniac. He's like, show me that thing I did at the park. Yeah, <laughs> you know, let me watch me go down that slide again. I'll fix it in post. Yeah, I'll fix it in post. <laughs> Let's put a filter on that next time. <laughs> um, and so, but I showed him this video of me with Cookie Monster, and he was. I saw him like his wheels turning in his head, like, wait, what's going on here? But then he just wanted to watch like seven times in a row. And I still don't, like, we haven't really talked about it. I don't know how he's processing it, but. He probably thinks like everyone's dad gets to go hang with Cookie I know, Monster. it's a weird thing to like, it's a, I'm trying to figure out how to navigate the fact that I have been on TV and people when we go out know who I am. Like right. that's a complicated thing so for I, me. I like, I kept any acting things away from him for as long as I could yeah. that I did. Cause I, I don't know why I just didn't, just want to remain sort of in normal town. I yeah, guess. yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, it's not like I'm so famous that I can't step outside. Like, I mean, you're pretty it's famous, much, but it must be different if you're like, I don't know. I think of more famous people. Yeah, like Angelina must, Jolie or must, something. Yeah, exactly. It must like. You, wait, are you saying she's case, more famous than I am? <laughs> no, 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 not at I'm all. Pissed. I would never say this that. I would is never over. insinuate. <laughs> um, listeners, Jack, Rachel Jack, just please. flipped the table. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but um, but no, I would. But then yeah, occasionally people come up to you. Yeah. And his first response when he was really little was like, did they ask about me? Like, yeah. do, they know, do they know I'm your son? It was so cute. He'd be like, do they know I'm your son? <laughs> I, don't really know I know her. Like, you know, she's my so mom. It was so cute. But one time someone came up and they said, like, um, he must have been, like, six. And, like, what's it like to grow up with such a funny mom? And he goes, like, I make her laugh more than she makes me laugh. <laughs> And it's true. It's true, like, yeah. Because I'm not at home like, yeah, da, 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 da. Yeah, so like, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I was like, that was a good, honest response. It is. And then I had to say, like, that's true. So. It also brings up a funny thing that I think about often is like, when you do make a career out of making people laugh and being funny, people expect you to just be hilarious at all times. And, and I I'm definitely am not, not that. I am not either. <laughs> I mean, I'm not even, even among my SNL friends, like, I mean, I, I think I'm funny like how your friends are funny, but yeah, I'm yeah. definitely not like quipping and stand up and like, so sometimes you meet people, they think you're going to just knock their socks off. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I don't really have that gene. But don't you ever sometimes feel like there's expectation from people? They're like, oh, she's do something Probably. funny. Like yeah. that's more like, yeah, strangers. I don't know, I feel that. Maybe it's just More me. like at a wedding, like that kind of thing. Yeah. Like if you're like... People that kind of, you don't I've gotten in trouble from, I get so angry with this. It's happened to me twice now. Where I've been invited to someone's wedding. Yeah. And the married couple gets annoyed because peep, their guests are wanting <gasps> photos with me. Oh, and it's their day. And I have no control no over way. it. And like, I don't also want to be mean and say no to people when they're asking for photos. But like, I've had a few times where people have been like, you're stealing my thunder. No. They don't say that, but like, it's sort of insinuated and I've seen them get annoyed. I want and names. So <laughs> I want names. Weddings have become That's a really weird. tricky thing for me. And there, there was actually a friend of mine who invited me to their wedding. I said, "Listen," and she's like, "I'm going to tell my friends, to, I'm going to tell my friends and family to be cool around you and leave you alone." And like, I was like, "I don't need to be left alone. Like, I'm, I'd love to like get yeah. to know all your friends and family, but like." I also can't control if, like, they want photos with me or something. Right. I don't want you to be upset that, like, right. that's happening. I had to have oh. a little discussion. Like, we had to, like, lay the yeah. groundwork for, like, what was what could and happen. how did it go? It was fine. But it's because we had a discussion about it. And I was just like, this is not something I'm you asking set for. set up your autograph table. I set up my autograph a table. table nine. It's a little, like, a little Jesse's card table. Jesse's signing at table nine <laughs> during the ceremony. We're doing <laughs> selfies between 8.30 and 9. <laughs> um, yeah, ridiculous. Rachel... Jesse. I'm going to see you in a few days on your podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. We're going to be sick of each We're gonna other. We're going to be so sick of You're each gonna other. You're going to have to think of woo-woo stories. <laughs> I can't wait to see what you've come up with, if anything. If anything. <laughs> Next week on Dinners on Me, you know him as leading man Charlie Spring on the irresistible Netflix series Heartstopper. It's Joe Locke. We'll get into what it's like to grow up on the Isle of Man, his insane audition process for Heartstopper, plus a hint at what to expect in season three of the acclaimed Netflix series. Dinners on Me is a production of Sony Music Entertainment and A Kid Named Beckett Productions. It's hosted by me, Jesse Tyler Ferguson. It's executive produced by me and Jonathan Hirsch. Our showrunner is Joanna Clay. Our associate producer is Angela Vang. Sam Baer engineered this episode. Hans Dale Shee composed our theme music. Our head of production is Sammy Allison. Special thanks to Tamika Balance-Kolasny and Justin Makita. 
I'm Jesse Tyler Ferguson. Join me next week.